Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we reach the final part of Alice Through the Looking Glass. Alice has nearly reached the last row of the Looking Glass World chessboard when she will apparently become a queen. Will she make it, and will she make it back home? As we return to the story, she is covering her ears against a loud drumming. It's time to pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy the final part of Alice Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Chapter 8 It's My Own Invention After a while, the noise seemed gradually to die away, till all was dead silence, and Alice lifted up her head in some alarm. There was no one to be seen, and her first thought was that she must have been dreaming about the lion and the unicorn and those queer Anglo-Saxon messengers. However, there was the great dish still lying at her feet on which she had tried to cut the plum cake. So I wasn't dreaming, after all, she said to herself, unless we're all part of the same dream. Only I do hope it's my dream and not the Red King's. I don't like belonging to another person's dream, she went on in a rather complaining tone. I've a great mind to go and wake him to see what happens. At this moment her thoughts were interrupted by a loud shouting of, Ahoy! Ahoy! Check! And a knight dressed in crimson armour came galloping down upon her, brandishing a great club. Just as he reached her, the horse stopped suddenly. "'You're my prisoner!' the knight cried as he tumbled off his horse. Startled as she was, Alice was more frightened for him than for herself at the moment, and watched him with some anxiety as he mounted again. As soon as he was comfortably in the saddle, he began once more. "'You're my—' But here another voice broke in. "'Ahoy! Ahoy! Check!' And Alice looked round in some surprise for the new enemy." This time it was a white knight. He drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse, just as the red knight had done. Then he got on again, and the two knights sat and looked at each other for some time without speaking. Alice looked from one to the other in some bewilderment. "'She's my prisoner, you know,' the red knight said at last. "'Yes, but then I came and rescued her,' the white knight replied. "'Well, we must fight for her, then.' said the Red Knight as he took up his helmet, which hung from his saddle and was something like the shape of a horse's head, and put it on. "'You will observe the rules of battle, of course,' the White Knight remarked, putting on his helmet too. "'I always do,' said the Red Knight, and they began banging away at each other with such fury that Alice got behind a tree to be out of the way of the blows. "'I wonder now what the rules of battle are,' she said to herself, as she watched the fight, timidly peeping out from her hiding place. "'One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks him off his horse, and if he misses, he tumbles off himself. And another rule seems to be that they hold their clubs with their arms, as if they were Punch and Judy. What a noise they make when they tumble, just like a whole set of firearms falling on the fender.' And how quiet the horses are. They let them get on and off them just as if they were tables. Another rule of battle that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they always fell on their heads, and the battle ended with their both falling off in this way, side by side. When they got back up again, they shook hands, and then the Red Knight mounted and galloped off. "'That was a glorious victory, wasn't it?' said the White Knight as he came up panting. "'I don't know,' Alice said doubtfully. I don't want to be anyone's prisoner. I want to be queen. So you will when you've crossed the next brook, said the white knight. I'll see you safe to the end of the wood, and then I must go back, you know. That's the end of my move. Thank you very much, said Alice. May I help you off with your helmet? It was evidently more than he could manage by himself. However, she managed to shake him out of it at last. Now one can breathe more easily, said the knight, putting back his shaggy hair with both hands and turning his gentle face and large, mild eyes to Alice. She thought she had never seen such a strange-looking soldier in all her life. He was dressed in tin armour, which seemed to fit him very badly, and he had a queer-shaped little deal box fastened across his shoulder, upside down with the lid hanging open. Alice looked at it with great curiosity. "'I see you're admiring my little box the knight said in a friendly tone. It's my own invention, to keep clothes and sandwiches in. You see, I carry it upside down so that the rain can't get in. But 
the things can get out, Alice remarked gently. Do you know the lid's open? I didn't know it, the knight said, a shade of vexation passing over his face. Then all the things must have fallen out, and the box is no use without them. He unfastened it as he spoke, and was just going to throw it into the bushes when a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and he hung it carefully on a tree. Can you guess why I did that? he said to Alice. Alice shook her head. In hopes some bees may make a nest in it, then I should get the honey. But you've got a beehive, or something like one, fastened to the saddle, said Alice. Yes, it's a very good beehive, the knight said in a discontented tone, one of the best kind, but not a single bee has come near it yet, and the other thing is a mouse trap. I suppose the mice keep the bees out, or the bees keep the mice out, I don't know which yet. I was wondering what the mouse trap was for, said Alice. It isn't very likely there would be any mice on the horse's back. Not very likely, perhaps, said the knight, but if they do come, I don't choose to have them running all about. You see, he went on after a pause, it's as well to be provided for everything. That's the reason the horse has all these anklets around its feet. But what are they for? Alice asked in a tone of great curiosity. To guard against the bites of sharks, the knight replied. It's an invention of my own, and now help me on. I'll go with you to the end of the wood. What's the dish for? It's meant for plum cake, said Alice. We'd better take it with us, the knight said. It'll come in handy if we find any plum cake. Help me to get it into this bag. It took a very long time to manage, though Alice held the bag open very carefully, because the knight was so very awkward in putting in the dish. The first two or three times that he tried, he fell in himself instead. It's a rather tight fit, you see, he said as they got it in at last. There are so many candlesticks in the bag. And he hung it to the saddle, which was already loaded with bunches of carrots and fire irons and many other things. I hope you've got your hair well fastened on, he continued as they set off. Only in the usual way, Alice said, smiling. That's hardly enough, he said anxiously. You see, the wind is so very strong here. It's as strong as soup. Have you invented a plan for keeping the hair from being blown off? Alice inquired. Not yet, said the knight, but I've a plan for keeping it from falling off. I should very much like to hear it. First you take an upright stick, said the knight. Then you make your hair creep up it like a fruit tree. Now the reason the hair falls off is because it hangs down. Things never fall upwards, you know. It's a plan of my own invention. You may try it if you like. It didn't sound a comfortable plan, Alice thought, and for a few minutes she walked on in silence, puzzling over the idea, and every now and then stopping to help the poor knight, who certainly was not a good rider. Whenever the horse stopped, which it did very often, he fell off in front, and whenever it went on again, which it generally did rather suddenly, he fell off behind. Otherwise he kept on pretty well, except that he had a habit of now and then falling off sideways, and as he generally did this on the side on which Alice was walking, she soon found that it was the best plan not to walk quite close to the horse. "'I'm afraid you've not had much practice in riding,' she ventured to say, as she was helping him up from his fifth tumble. The knight looked very much surprised and a little offended by the remark. "'What makes you say that?' he asked, as he scrambled back into the saddle, keeping hold of Alice's hair with one hand to save himself from falling over on the other side. "'Because people don't fall off quite so often when they've had much practice.' "'I've had plenty of practice,' the knight said gravely. "'Plenty of practice.' Alice could think of nothing better to say than, "'Indeed? "'But she said it as heartily as she could. "'They went on a little way in silence after this, "'the knight with his eyes shut, muttering to himself, "'and Alice watching anxiously for the next tumble. "'The great art of riding,' the knight suddenly began in a loud voice, "'waving his right arm as he spoke, "'is to keep—' Here the sentence ended as suddenly as it had begun, as the knight fell heavily on the top of his head, exactly in the path where Alice was walking. She was quite frightened this time, and said in an anxious tone as she picked him up, "'I hope no bones are broken.' "'None to speak of,' the knight said, as if he didn't mind breaking two or three of them. "'The great art of riding, as I was saying, is to keep your balance properly. Like this, you know.' He let go the bridle, and stretched out both his arms to show Alice what he meant— and this time he fell flat on his back, right under the horse's feet. "'Plenty of practice,' he went on repeating. 
all the time that Alice was getting him on his feet again. Plenty of practice. It's too ridiculous, cried Alice, losing all her patience this time. You ought to have a wooden horse on wheels, that you ought. Does that kind go smoothly? The knight asked in a tone of great interest, clasping his arms around the horse's neck as he spoke, just in time to save himself from tumbling off again. Much more smoothly than a live horse, Alice said, with a little scream of laughter, in spite of all she could do to prevent it. I'll get one, the knight said thoughtfully to himself. One or two, several. There was a short silence after this, and then the knight went on again. I'm a great hand at inventing things. Now, I dare say you noticed that last time you picked me up that I was looking rather thoughtful. You were a little grave, said Alice. Well, just then I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Would you like to hear it? Very much indeed, Alice said politely. I'll tell you how I came to think of it, said the knight. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. The head is high enough already. Now, first I put my head on the top of the gate. Then I stand on my head. Then the feet are high enough, you see. Then I'm over, you see. Yes, I suppose you'd be over when that was done, Alice said thoughtfully. But don't you think it would be rather hard? I haven't tried it yet, the knight said gravely, so I can't tell for certain, but I'm afraid it would be a little hard. He looked so vexed at the idea that Alice changed the subject hastily. What a curious helmet you've got, she said cheerfully. Is that your invention too? The knight looked down proudly at his helmet, which hung from the saddle. Yes, he said, but I've invented a better one than that, like a sugar loaf. When I used to wear it, if I fell off the horse, it always touched the ground directly, so I had a very little way to fall, you see. But there was the danger of falling into it, to be sure. That happened to me once, and the worst of it was, before I could get out again, the other white knight came and put it on. He thought it was his own helmet. The knight looked so solemn about that that Alice did not dare to laugh. "'I'm afraid you must have hurt him,' she said in a trembling voice, being on the top of his head. "'I had to kick him, of course,' the knight said very seriously, and then he took the helmet off again. "'But it took hours and hours to get me out. I was fast as, as lightning, you know.' "'That's a very different kind of fastness,' Alice objected. The knight shook his head. "'It was all kinds of fastness with me, I can assure you,' he said. He raised his hands in some excitement as he said this, and instantly rolled out of the saddle and fell headlong into a deep ditch. Alice ran to the side of the ditch to look for him. She was rather startled by the fall, as for some time he had kept on very well, and she was afraid that he really was hurt this time. However, though she could see nothing but the soles of his feet, she was very relieved to hear that he was talking on in his usual tone. All kinds of fastness, he repeated, but it was careless of him to put on another man's helmet with the man in it, too. "'How can you go on talking so quietly head down?' Alice asked as she dragged him out by the feet and laid him in a heap on the bank. The knight looked surprised at the question. "'What does it matter where my body happens to be?' he said. "'My mind goes on working all the same. In fact, the more head downwards I am, the more I keep inventing new things. Now, the cleverest thing of the sort that I ever did, he went on after a pause, was inventing a new pudding during the meat course. In time to have it cooked for the next course, said Alice. Well, not the next course, the knight said in slow, thoughtful tone. No, certainly not the next course. Then it would have to be the next day. I suppose you wouldn't have two pudding courses in one dinner. Well, not the next day, the knight repeated as before. Not the next day, in fact, he went on, holding his head down and his voice getting lower and lower. I don't believe that pudding ever was cooked. In fact, I don't believe that pudding ever will be cooked. And yet it was a very clever pudding to invent. What did you mean it to be made of? Alice asked, hoping to cheer him up, for the poor knight seemed quite low-spirited about it. It began... "'With blotting paper,' the knight answered with a groan. "'That wouldn't be very nice, I'm afraid. "'Not very nice alone,' he interrupted quite eagerly. "'But you've no idea what a difference it makes mixing it with other things, "'such as gunpowder and sealing wax. "'And here I must leave you.' "'They had just come to the end of the wood. 
Alice could only look puzzled. She was thinking of the pudding. You are sad, the knight said in an anxious tone. Let me sing you a song to comfort you. Is it very long? Alice asked, for she had heard a good deal of poetry that day. It's long, said the knight, but very, very beautiful. Everybody that hears me sing it, either it brings the tears into their eyes, or else... Or else what? said Alice, for the knight had made a sudden pause. Or else it doesn't, you know. The name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. Oh, that's the name of the song, is it? Alice said, trying to feel interested. No, you don't understand, the knight said, looking a little vexed. That's what the name is called. The name is really The Aged, Aged Man. Then I ought to have said, that's what the song is called, Alice corrected herself. No, you oughtn't. That's quite another thing. The song is called Ways and Means, but that's only what it's called, you know. Well, what is the song then, said Alice, who was by this time completely bewildered. I was coming to that, the knight said. The song really is a sitting on a gate, and the tune's my own invention. So saying, he stopped his horse and let the reins fall on its neck, then, slowly beating time with one hand and with a faint smile lighting up his gentle, foolish face, as if he enjoyed the music of his song, he began. Of all the strange things that Alice saw in her journey through the looking-glass, this was the one that she always remembered most clearly. Years afterwards, she could bring the whole scene back again, as if it had been only yesterday. The mild blue eyes and kindly smile of the night the setting sun gleaming through his hair and shining on his armour in a blaze of light that quite dazzled her, the horse quietly moving about with the reins hanging loose on his neck, cropping the grass at her feet and the black shadows of the forest behind. All this she took in like a picture, as with one hand shading her eyes she leant against a tree, watching the strange pair and listening in a half-dream to the melancholy music of the song. I'll tell thee everything I can, there's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man, a-sitting on a gate. Who are you, aged man, I said, and how is it you live? And his answer trickled through my head, like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies, that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men, he said, who sail on stormy seas. And that's the way I get my bread, a trifle if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So having no reply to give to what the old man said, I cried, come tell me how you live, and thumped him on the head. His accents mild took up the tale, he said I go my ways, and when I find a mountain rill, I set it in a blaze, and thence they make a stuff they call Roland's Macassar oil. Yet two pence half penny is all they gave me for my toil. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on batter, and so go on from day to day, getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to side, until his face was blue. Come tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. He said, I hunt for haddock's eyes among the heather bright, and work them into waistcoat buttons in the silent night. And these I do not sell for gold or coin of silvery shine, but for a copper halfpenny, and that will purchase nine. I sometimes dig for buttered rolls or set limed twigs for crabs. I sometimes search the grassy knolls for wheels of handsome cabs, 
and that's the way, he gave a wink, by which I get my wealth, and very gladly will I drink your honour's noble health. I heard him then, for I had just completed my design, to keep the men I bridge from rust by boiling it in wine. I thanked him much for telling me the way he got his wealth, but chiefly for his wish that he might drink my noble health. And now, if e'er by chance I put my fingers into glue, or madly squeeze a right hand foot into a left hand shoe, or if I drop upon my toe a very heavy weight, I weep, for it reminds me so of that old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his woe, who rocked his body to and fro, and muttered mumbling and low, as if his mouth were full of dough, who snorted like a buffalo that summer evening long ago, a sitting on a gate. As the knight sang the last words of the ballad, he gathered up the reins, turned his horse's head along the road by which they had come. "'You've only got a few yards to go,' he said, "'down the hill and over that little brook, and then you'll be a queen. "'But you'll stay and see me off first, he added, as Alice turned with an eager look in the direction to which he pointed. "'I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief when I get to that turn in the road. "'I think it'll encourage me, you see.' "'Of course I'll wait,' said Alice, and... Thank you very much for coming so far, and for the song. I liked it very much. I hope so, the knight said doubtfully, but you didn't cry so much as I thought you would. So they shook hands, and then the knight rode slowly away into the forest. It won't take long to see him off, I expect, Alice said to herself as she stood watching him. There he goes, right on his head as usual. However, he gets on again pretty easily. That comes of having so many things hung around the horse. So she went on talking to herself, as she watched the horse walking leisurely along the road and the knight tumbling off, first on one side and then on the other. After the fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn, and then she waved her handkerchief at him and waited till he was out of sight. I hope it encourages him, she said, as she turned to run down the hill. And now for the last brook, and to be a queen. How grand it sounds! A very few steps took her to the edge of the brook. The eighth square at last, she cried as she bounded across, and threw herself down to rest on a lawn as soft as moss, with little flower beds dotted about it here and there. Oh, how glad I am to get here! And what is this on my head? she exclaimed in a tone of dismay as she put her hands up to something very heavy and fitted tight all around her head. But... "'How can it have got there without my knowing it?' she said to herself as she lifted it off, and set it on her lap to make out what it could possibly be. It was a golden crown. Chapter 9. Queen Alice "'Well, this is grand,' said Alice. "'I'd never expected I should be a queen so soon. And I'll tell you what it is, Your Majesty.' She went on in a severe tone. She was always rather fond of scolding herself. It'll never do for you to be lolling about on the grass like that. Queens have to be dignified, you know. So she got up and walked about, rather stiffly just at first, as she was afraid that the crown might come off. But she comforted herself with the thought that there was nobody to see her. And if I really am a queen, she said as she sat down again, I shall be able to manage it quite well in time. Everything was happening so oddly that she didn't feel a bit surprised at finding the Red Queen and the White Queen sitting close to her, one on each side. She would have liked very much to ask them how they came there, but she feared it would not be quite civil. However, there would be no harm, she thought, in asking if the game was over. "'Please, would you tell me?' she began, looking timidly at the Red Queen. "'Speak when you're spoken to,' the Queen sharply interrupted her. "'But if everybody obeyed that rule,' said Alice, who was always ready for a little argument, "'and if you only spoke when you were spoken to, "'and if the other person always waited for you to begin, "'you see, nobody would ever say anything, so that—' "'Ridiculous!' cried the Queen. "'Why don't you see, child?' "'Here she broke off with a frown, and after thinking for a minute, "'suddenly changed the subject of the conversation. 
What do you mean by, if you really are a queen, what right have you to call yourself so? You can't be a queen, you know, till you've passed the proper examination, and the sooner we begin it, the better. I only said if, poor Alice pleaded in a piteous tone. The two queens looked at each other, and the Red Queen remarked with a little shudder, she says she only said if. But she said a great deal more than that, the White Queen moaned, wringing her hands. Oh, ever so much more than that. So you did, you know, the Red Queen said to her. Always speak the truth, think before you speak, and write it down afterwards. I'm sure I didn't mean... Alice was beginning, but the Red Queen interrupted her impatiently. That's just what I complain of. You should have meant... What do you suppose is the use of a child without any meaning? Even a joke should have some meaning, and a child's more important than a joke, I hope. You couldn't deny that, even if you tried with both hands. I don't deny things with my hands, Alice objected. Nobody said you did, said the Red Queen. I said you couldn't if you tried. She's in that state of mind, said the White Queen, that she wants to deny something, only she doesn't know what to deny. A nasty, vicious temper, the Red Queen remarked, and then there was an uncomfortable silence for a minute or two. The Red Queen broke the silence by saying to the White Queen, I invite you to Alice's dinner party this afternoon. The White Queen smiled feebly and said, And I invite you. I didn't know I was to have a party at all, said Alice, but if there is to be one, I think I ought to invite the guests. "'We gave you the opportunity of doing it,' the Red Queen remarked, "'but I dare say you've not had many lessons in manners yet.' "'Manners are not taught in lessons,' said Alice. "'Lessons teach you to do sums and that sort of thing.' "'And you do addition?' the White Queen asked. "'What's one and 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 one?' "'I don't know,' said Alice. "'I lost count.' "'She can't do addition,' the Red Queen interrupted. "'Can you do subtraction? Take nine from eight. Nine from eight. Uh, I can't, you know,' Alice replied very readily. "'But she can't do subtraction,' said the White Queen. "'Can you do division? Divide a loaf by a knife. What's the answer to that?' "'I suppose,' Alice was beginning, but the Red Queen answered for her. "'Bread and butter, of course. Try another subtraction sum. Uh, take a bone from a dog. What remains?' Alice considered. The bone wouldn't remain, of course, if I took it, and the dog wouldn't remain. It would come to bite me, and I'm sure I shouldn't remain. Then you should think nothing would remain, said the Red Queen. I think that's the answer. Wrong as usual, said the Red Queen. The dog's temper would remain. But I don't see how... Why, look here, the Red Queen cried. The dog would lose its temper, wouldn't it? Perhaps it would, Alice replied cautiously. Then if the dog went away, its temper would remain, the Queen exclaimed triumphantly. Alice said as gravely as she could, they might go different ways. But she couldn't help to think to herself, what dreadful nonsense we are talking. She can't do sums a bit, the Queen said together with great emphasis. Can you do sums, Alice said, turning suddenly on the White Queen for she didn't like being found fault with so much. The Queen gasped and shut her eyes. I can do addition if you give me time, but I can't do subtraction under any circumstances. Of course you know your ABC, said the Red Queen. To be sure I do, said Alice. So do I, the White Queen whispered. We'll often say it over together, dear, and I'll tell you a secret. I can read words of one letter. Isn't that grand? However, don't be discouraged. You'll come on to it in time. Here the Red Queen began again. Can you answer useful questions, she said. How is bread made? I know that, Alice cried eagerly. You take some flour. Where do you pick the flour? The White Queen asked. In a garden or in the hedges? Well, it isn't picked at all, Alice explained. It's ground. "'How many acres of ground?' said the White Queen. "'You mustn't leave out so many things.' "'Fan her head!' the Red Queen anxiously interrupted. "'She'll be feverish after so much thinking.' So they set to work and fanned her with bunches of leaves, till she had to beg them to leave off. It blew her hair about so. "'She's all right again now,' said the Red Queen. "'Do you know languages? What's the French for fiddle-dee-dee?' 
Fiddle de Dee's not English, Alice replied gravely. Whoever said it was, said the Red Queen. Alice thought she knew a way out of the difficulty this time. If you'll tell me what language Fiddle de Dee is, I'll tell you the French for it, she exclaimed triumphantly. But the Red Queen drew herself up rather stiffly and said, Queens never make bargains. I wish queens never asked questions, Alice thought to herself. Oh, don't let us quarrel, the White Queen said in an anxious tone. What is the cause of lightning? The cause of lightning, Alice said very decidedly, for she felt quite certain about this, is the thunder. No, no, she hastily corrected herself. I meant the other way. It's too late to correct it, said the Red Queen. When you've once said a thing, that fixes it, and you must take the consequences. Which reminds me, the White Queen said, looking down and nervously clasping and unclasping her hands. We had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. I mean, one of the last set of Tuesdays, you know. Alice was puzzled. In our country, there's only one day at a time. The Red Queen said, Oh, that's a poor, thin way of doing things. Now here, we mostly have days and nights two or three at a time, and sometimes in the winter we take as many as five nights together, for warmth, you know. Are five nights warmer than one night, then? Alice ventured to ask. Five times as warm, of course. But should they be five times as cold, by the same rule? Just so, cried the Red Queen, five times as warm and five times as cold, just as I'm five times as rich as you are and five times as clever. Alice sighed and gave it up. It's exactly like a riddle with no answer, she thought. Humpty Dumpty saw it too, the White Queen went on with a low voice, more as if she were talking to herself. He came to the door with a corkscrew in his hand. What did he want? said the Red Queen. He said he would come in, the White Queen went on, because he was looking for a hippopotamus. Now, as it happens, there wasn't such a thing in the house that morning. Is there generally? Alice asked in an astonished tone. Well, only on Thursdays, said the Queen. I know what he came for, said Alice. He wanted to punish the fish, because... Here the White Queen began again. It was such a thunderstorm, you can't think. She never could, you know, said the Red Queen. And part of the roof came off, and ever so much thunder got in, and it went rolling round the room in great lumps and knocking over the tables and things, till I was so frightened I couldn't remember my own name. Alice thought to herself, I should never try to remember my name in the middle of an accident. Where would be the use in that? But she did not say this aloud for fear of hurting the poor Queen's feelings. "'Your Majesty must excuse her,' the Red Queen said to Alice, taking one of the White Queen's hands in her own and gently stroking it. "'She means well, but she can't help saying foolish things as a general rule.' The White Queen looked timidly at Alice, who felt she ought to say something kind, but really couldn't think of anything in the moment. "'She never was really well brought up,' the Red Queen said. "'But it's amazing how good-tempered she is. Pat her on the head and see how pleased she'll be.' but this was more than Alice had courage to do. A little kindness and putting her hair in papers would do wonders with her. The White Queen gave a deep sigh and laid her head on Alice's shoulder. I am so sleepy, she moaned. She's tired, poor thing, said the Red Queen. Smooth her hair, lend her your nightcap and sing her a soothing lullaby. I haven't got a nightcap with me, said Alice, as she tried to obey the first direction, and I don't know any soothing lullabies. "'I must do it myself,' said the Red Queen, and she began. "'Hush, my lady, in Alice's lap, till the feast's ready, we've time for a nap. When the feast's over, we'll go to the ball, Red Queen and White Queen and Alice and all.' And "'Now you know the words,' she added, as she put her head down on Alice's other shoulder. "'Just sing it through to me. I'm getting sleepy too.' In another moment, both queens were fast asleep and snoring loud. "'What am I to do?' exclaimed Alice, looking about in great perplexity, as first one round head and then the other rolled down from her shoulder and lay like a heavy lump in her lap. "'I don't think it ever happened before that anyone had to take care of two queens asleep at once. No, not in all the history of England. It couldn't, you know, because there never was more than one queen at a time.' Uh, do wake up, you heavy things, she went on in an impatient tone, but there was no answer but a gentle snoring. 
The snoring got more distinct every minute and sounded more like a tune. At last she could even make out the words, and she listened so eagerly that when the two great heads vanished from her lap, she hardly missed them. She was standing before an arched doorway, over which were the words Queen Alice in large letters, and on each side of the arch there was a bell handle. One was marked Visitor's Bell and the other Servant's Bell. I'll wait till the song's over, thought Alice, and then I'll ring the... the... which bell must I ring? She went on, very much puzzled by the names. I'm not a visitor and I'm not a servant. There ought to be one marked Queen, you know. Just then the door opened a little way, and a creature with a long beak put its head out for a moment and said, "'No admittance till the week after next,' and then shut the door again with a bang. Alice knocked and rang in vain for a long time, but at last a very old frog who was sitting under a tree got up and hobbled slowly towards her. He was dressed in bright yellow and had enormous boots on. "'What is it now?' the frog said in a deep hoarse whisper. Alice turned round, ready to find fault with anybody. "'Where's the servant whose business it is to answer the door?' she began angrily. "'Which door?' said the frog. Alice almost stamped with irritation at the slow drawl with which he spoke. "'This door, of course!' The frog looked at the door with his large, dull eyes for a minute. Then he went nearer and rubbed it with his thumb, as if he were trying whether the paint would come off. Then he looked at Alice. "'To answer the door,' he said. "'What's it been thinking of?' He was so hoarse that Alice could scarcely hear him. "'I don't know what you mean,' she said. "'I talks English, doesn't I?' the frog went on. "'Or are you deaf? What did it ask you?' "'Nothing,' Alice said impatiently. "'I've been knocking at it.' "'Shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that,' the frog muttered. "'Vexes it, you know.' Then he went up and gave the door a kick with one of his great feet. "'You let it alone,' he panted out as he hobbled back to his tree, "'and it'll let you alone, you know.' At this moment the door was flung open and a shrill voice was heard singing, "'To the looking-glass world it was Alice that said, "'Of a sceptre in hand, I've a crown on my head. "'Let the looking-glass creatures, whatever they be, "'come and dine with the Red Queen, the White Queen and me.' and hundreds of voices joined in the chorus. Then fill up the glasses as quick as you can, and sprinkle the table with buttons and bran. Put cats in the coffee and mice in the tea, and welcome Queen Alice with thirty times three. Then followed a confused noise of cheering, and Alice thought to herself, thirty times three makes ninety. I wonder if anyone's counting. In a moment there was silence again, and the same shrill voice sang another verse. "'Oh, looking-glass creatures,' quoth Alice, draw near. "'Tis an honour to see me, a favour to hear. "'Tis a privilege high to have dinner and tea, "'along with the Red Queen, the White Queen, and me.' Then came the chorus again. "'Then fill up the glasses with treacle and ink, "'or anything else that is pleasant to drink. "'Mix sand with the cider and wool with the wine, "'and welcome Queen Alice with ninety times nine. Ninety times nine, Alice repeated in despair. Oh, that'll never be done. I'd better go in at once. And there was a dead silence the moment she appeared. Alice glanced nervously along the table as she walked up the large hall and noticed that there were about fifty guests of all kinds. Some were animals, some birds, and there were even a few flowers among them. I'm glad they've come without waiting to be asked, she thought. I should never have known who were the right people to invite. There were three chairs at the head of the table. The red and white queens had already taken two of them, but the middle one was empty. Alice sat down in it, rather uncomfortable in the silence, and longing for someone to speak. At last the red queen began. "'You've missed the soup and fish,' she said. "'Put on the joint!' And the waiters set a leg of mutton before Alice, who looked at it rather anxiously, as she had never had to carve a joint before. "'You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to that leg of mutton.' said the Red Queen. Alice, mutton, mutton, Alice. The leg of mutton got up in the dish and made a little bow to Alice, and Alice returned the bow, not knowing whether to be frightened or amused. May I give you a slice, she said, taking up the knife and fork and looking from one queen to the other. Certainly not, the Red Queen said very decidedly. It isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to. Remove the joint and the waiters carried it off and brought a large plum pudding in its place. 
I won't be introduced to the pudding, please, Alice said rather hastily, or we shall get no dinner at all. May I give you some? But the Red Queen looked sulky and growled. Pudding? Alice? Alice pudding? Remove the pudding! And the waiters took it away so quickly that Alice couldn't return its bow. However, she didn't see why the Red Queen should be the only one to give orders, so as an experiment she called out, Waiter, bring back the pudding. And there it was again in a moment, like a conjuring trick. It was so large that she couldn't help feeling a little shy with it, as she had with the mutton. However, she conquered her shyness by a great effort and cut a slice and handed it to the Red Queen. "'What impertinence!' said the pudding. "'I wonder how you'd like it if I were to slice it out of you, you creature!' It spoke in a thick, suety sort of voice, and Alice hadn't a word to say in reply. She could only sit and look at it and gasp. "'Make a remark,' said the Red Queen. "'It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation to the pudding.' "'Do you know, I've had such a quantity of poetry repeated to me today,' Alice began, a little frightened at finding that the moment she opened her lips there was dead silence and all eyes were fixed on her. "'And it's a very curious thing, I think. "'Every poem was about fishes in some way. "'Do you know why they're so fond of fishes all about here?' She spoke to the Red Queen, whose answer was a little wide of the mark. "'As to fishes,' she said, very slowly and solemnly, putting her mouth close to Alice's ear, "'Her White Majesty knows a lovely riddle, all in poetry, all about fishes. Shall she repeat it?' "'Her Red Majesty is very kind to mention it,' the White Queen murmured into Alice's other ear, in a voice like the cooing of a pigeon. "'It would be such a treat. May I?' "'Please do.' Alice said very politely. The White Queen laughed with delight and stroked Alice's cheek. Then she began. First the fish must be caught, then it's easy. A baby, I think, could have caught it. Next the fish must be bought. That is easy. A penny, I think, would have bought it. Now cook me the fish. That is easy, and will not take more than a minute. Let it lie in a dish. That is easy, because it already is in it. "'Bring it here, let me sup. "'It is easy to set such a dish on the table. "'Take the dish cover off. "'Ah, that is so hard that I fear I'm unable. "'For it holds it like glue, "'holds the lid to the dish while it lies in the middle. "'Which is easiest to do? "'Undish cover the fish or dish cover the riddle?' "'Take a moment to think about it and then guess,' said the Red Queen. "'Meanwhile, we'll drink your health. "'Queen Alice's health!' she screamed at the top of her voice, "'and all the guests began drinking it directly, "'and very queerly they managed it. "'Some of them put their glasses upon their heads like extinguishers "'and drank all that trickled down into their faces. "'Others upset the decanters and drank the wine "'as it ran off the edges of the table. "'And three of them, who looked like kangaroos, scrambled into the dish of roast mutton and began eagerly lapping up the gravy. Just like pigs in a trough, thought Alice. "'You ought to return thanks in a neat speech,' the Red Queen said, frowning at Alice as she spoke. "'We must support you, you know,' the White Queen whispered, as Alice got up to do it very obediently, but a little frightened. "'Thank you very much,' she whispered in reply. "'But I can do quite well without.' "'That wouldn't be the tall the thing,' the Red Queen said very decidedly, so Alice tried to submit to it with good grace. "'And they did push so,' she said afterwards, when she was telling her sister the history of the feast. "'You would have thought they wanted to squeeze me flat.' In fact, it was rather difficult for her to keep in her place while she made her speech. The two queens pushed her so, one on each side, that they nearly lifted her up into the air. "'I rise to return thanks,' Alice began." and she really did rise as she spoke several inches, but she got hold of the edge of the table and managed to pull herself back down again. "'Take care of yourself!' screamed the White Queen, seizing Alice's hair with both her hands. "'Something's going to happen!' And then, as Alice afterwards described it, all sorts of things happened in a moment. The candles all grew up into the ceiling, looking something like a bed of rushes with fireworks at the top. As to the bottles, they each took a pair of plates, which they hastily fitted on as wings, and so, with forks for legs, went fluttering about in all directions. And very like birds they look, Alice thought to herself, as well as she could in the dreadful confusion that was beginning. At this moment she heard a hoarse laugh at her side, and turned to see what was the matter with the White Queen, but instead of the Queen 
there was the leg of mutton sitting in the chair. "'Here I am!' cried a voice from the soup tureen, and Alice turned again, just in time to see the Queen's broad, good-natured face grinning at her for a moment from the edge of the tureen before disappearing into the soup. There was not a moment to be lost. Already several of the guests were lying down in the dishes, and the soup ladle was walking up the table towards Alice's chair and beckoning to her impatiently to get out of its way. "'I can't stand this any longer,' she cried as she jumped up and seized the tablecloth with both hands. One good pull, and plates, dishes, guests and candles came crashing down together in a heap on the floor. "'And as for you,' she went on, turning fiercely upon the Red Queen, whom she considered as the cause of all the mischief. But the Queen was no longer at her side. She had suddenly dwindled down to the size of a little doll and was now on the table, merrily running round and round after her own shawl, which was trailing behind her. At any other time, Alice would have felt surprised at this, but she was far too much excited to be surprised at anything now. "'As for you,' she repeated, catching hold of the little creature in the very act of jumping over a bottle which had just lighted upon the table, "'I'll shake you into a kitten, that I will.'" Chapter 10 Shaking She took her off the table as she spoke, and shook her backwards and forwards with all her might. The Red Queen made no resistance whatever, only her face grew very small, and her eyes got large and green and still. As Alice went on shaking her, she kept on growing shorter and fatter and softer and rounder and... Chapter 11 Waking And it really was a kitten, after all. Chapter 12 Which Dreamed It "'Your Majesty shouldn't purr so loud,' Alice said, rubbing her eyes and addressing the kitten respectfully, yet with some severity. "'You woke me out of... oh, such a nice dream. And you've been along with me, Kitty, all through the looking-glass world. Did you know it, dear?' "'It is a very inconvenient habit of kittens,' as Alice had once made the remark, "'that whatever you say to them, they always purr.' If they would only purr for yes and mew for no, or any rule of that sort, she had said, so that one could keep up a conversation. But how can you talk with a person if they always say the same thing? On this occasion, the kitten only purred, and it was impossible to guess whether it meant yes or no. So Alice hunted among the chessmen on the table till she had found the Red Queen, then she went down on her knees on the hearth rug and put the kitten and the queen to look at each other. "'Now, Kitty,' she cried, clapping her hands triumphantly, "'confess that was what you turned into!' "'But it wouldn't look at it,' she said, when she was explaining the thing afterward to her sister. It turned away its head and pretended not to see it, but it looked a little ashamed of itself, so I think it must have been the Red Queen. "'Sit up a little more stiffly, dear,' Aris cried with a merry laugh, and curtsy while you're thinking what to... what to purr. It saves time, remember? And she caught it up and gave it one little kiss, just in honour of having been a Red Queen. Snowdrop, my pet, she went on, looking over her shoulder to the white kitten, which was sitting patiently, undergoing its toilet. When will Dinah have finished with your white majesty, I wonder? That must have been the reason you were so untidy in my dream. Dinah, do you know that you're scrubbing a white queen? Really, it's most disrespectful of you. And what did Dinah turn to, I wonder? She prattled on as she settled comfortably down, with one elbow in the rug and her chin in her hand to watch the kittens. Tell me, Dinah, did you turn into Humpty Dumpty? I think you did. However, you'd better not mention it to your friends just yet, for I'm not sure. By the way, Kitty... If only you'd been really with me in my dream, there was one thing you would have enjoyed. I had such a quantity of poetry said to me, all about fishes. Tomorrow morning you shall have a real treat. All the time you're eating your breakfast, I'll repeat the walrus and the carpenter to you, and then you can make believe it's oysters, dear. Now, Kitty, let's consider who it was that dreamed it all. This is a serious question, my dear, and you should not go on licking your paw like that, as if Dinah hadn't washed you this morning. You see, Kitty, it must have been either me or the Red King. He was part of my dream, of course, but then I was a part of his dream, too. Was it the Red King, Kitty? You were his wife, my dear, so you ought to know. Oh, Kitty, 
do help to settle it. I'm sure your paw can't wait. But the provoking kitten only began on the other paw and pretended it hadn't heard the question. Which do you think it was? A boat beneath a sunny sky, lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. Children three that nestle near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. Long has paled that sunny sky, echoes fade and memories die, autumn frosts have slain July. Still she haunts me, phantom-wise, Alice moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. Children yet, the tale to hear, eager eye and willing ear, lovingly shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the days go by, dreaming as the summers die ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the golden gleam. Life, what is it but a dream? And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed Alice Through the Looking Glass. If you did enjoy it, then please consider supporting The Well-Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with another classic story. I hope you can join me. <laughs>